Big American cities have long struggled with the challenge of homeless populations as part of their urban mix. Dr. Mitchell Katz is president and CEO of NYC Health and Hospitals, the largest municipal health care organization in the United States. He's worked in three big U.S. cities, L.A., San Francisco, and currently New York, at the intersection of housing and health. And he joins us now for more. It's great to meet you. Thanks for coming in tonight. Thank you, Sue. You talk about homelessness in a way that I have not heard others talk about homelessness. You talk about it as a curable condition. What does that mean? Well, as a doctor, if somebody has cancer or severe heart disease, end-stage kidney disease, I can be a comforting doctor, but I can't cure their problem. If someone comes to me and they're homeless, I have a cure for that. I can house them. They will cease to be homeless. There is a continuum of care, quote unquote, for homelessness right now, that in your view doesn't work. Explain what that continuum of care is and why it doesn't work. Well, the idea is that people who are homeless on the street and shelter, they can't just be put into housing. You have to first help them with their addictions, then you have to help them with their mental health issues, then you have to get them more structure in their lives, activities, a place to go, and only then can you house them. But of course, it's almost impossible to achieve sobriety when you're living under the freeway or in an open shelter. So we have found that housing first is a much more effective tool whereby first we put people in a safe environment, then in that safe environment, we work on their mental health and addictions. I've heard you talk about the economics of doing it that way. Can you compare the costs of, of, of the cost of keeping somebody homeless while you work on all that other stuff versus putting them in homes right away and then dealing with all that other stuff? Well, it's much less expensive to take care of people in their home than in the hospital, in the emergency room, or in the jail. Uh, in, the, in the case of the jail, which is one of the places we had the most success in Los Angeles, taking homeless people with severe mental illness who were uh, in the jail for non-violent crimes and actually getting them into treatment, the jail costs $150,000 a year. We could house people for $1,000 a month. So huge savings from putting people in structured treatment. If you're a homeless person, you can certainly understand the appeal of being in a hospital or even being in jail, where you might get three squares a day and a bed to sleep on, as you put it, instead of living under the freeway. How, how, do, we get, how do we get society to reconsider that whole picture so that tackling homelessness first is the priority as opposed to everything else? I've always tried to marry the humanitarian part, which most people get immediately, that living under a freeway, living, walking in the rain, you know, seeking out someplace to use a restroom isn't good. We had in San Diego in the United States a huge hepatitis A epidemic, which was caused by homeless people who frankly have no place to wash their hands, no place to use the restroom. We have uh, people living in circumstances that we wouldn't accept as a refugee camp. You come upon these encampments and you would say, well, where's the running water? Um, where's the bathroom? And the answer is there is none. So it's marrying the humanitarian part with the public health part. You don't want the spread of epidemics like hepatitis A. With mm -hmm. This is actually more cost effective because hospital would cost in the United States two or $3,000 a day compared to $1,000 a month for housing. Two to three thousand dollars a day versus a thousand bucks a month. Correct. The economics of that seem pretty bloody obvious. Yes. So why isn't it happening? Well, there are there are a variety of issues and obstacles that have to be encountered. Uh, there is the wrong pockets problem. So that's you have the money, but it's in a different place. That's one of the challenges we faced around the jail. Hang on, I think I get this. If if you if a homeless person shows up at a hospital, Medicare will pay for that, but there's no equivalent to Medicare to put them in a home. Perfect. That's the gist of it, eh? Wrong pocket problem. Wrong pocket problem. Right. Huh. Uh, you have sometimes uh, NIMBYism, which stands for not in my backyard. Mm -hmm. So we have people who they fully, fully support housing the homeless, but they don't feel their neighborhood is the right place to do it. Um, and so there's a project in Los Angeles, which is stalled, very appropriate place, very nice building, lawsuit from the person who owns the land across from the development. 
-hmm. You can get into issues of, yes, we support housing, but not in my neighborhood. There, there is a, there is certainly a sense among some people that it's not NIMBYism. It's, it's all the elites and all the rich people want to help the homeless, but they want to make sure that these new homeless shelters, for example, uh, or the new homes for the homeless people are put in the neighborhoods where lower income people live as opposed to where the rich people live. Can you understand the public's frustration with that view? Absolutely. I mean, I do think that there is a uh, reason to try to put housing where homeless people are, right? I think that's a reasonable thing. And we did that a lot in Los Angeles where we'd say, okay, Hollywood, you have this many homeless people. We want to put this amount of housing. I think trying to move homeless people from one area to another is always going to be extra controversial. Mm -hmm. Are there different types of homelessness? Well, the, the big two groups are the economically homeless. The economically homeless just need a boost up economically. So they lost a job, they were previously housed. Uh, they're a lot easier and less expensive to provide housing for. The group I've been most focused on are those people who have severe mental illness, addictions, other physical health problems. They're the people who are causing the health expenses that we were talking about before. They're the people who are going to the emergency rooms, who are in the hospitals. Uh, and so that's the group that's both most visible, the group that people think about, the person pushing the shopping cart, living in the tent. Um, and they're the people you can save the most money on if you house them. I, I know even in downtown Toronto, uh, if, when you talk to visitors, they are astonished at how much homelessness there is in plain sight in downtown Toronto where the wealth is unreal. You see some of the tallest skyscrapers, you know, anywhere. Um, you've been in three big American cities and you have learned a lot, no doubt, about how to handle these things. What lessons can we learn here that you have learned in those San Francisco, LA, New York, that might help us figure this out? Sure. Well, first, we in the United States, we always assume you Canadians are so much more humane in your treatment. So it, it surprises us that there are, true. That I, there I are so many homeless people mm -hmm. in a place with obviously so much wealth. Um, every city has to find its own solution. Uh, so. Uh, the way we did it in San Francisco was different than Los Angeles and different than what New York City is working on. So it has to follow conditions. So in Los Angeles, for example, we were really able to tap into the private rental market. Here in Toronto, your vacancy rate is less than 1%. Yeah. So you're not going to be able to rent units um, in the private market. So you need some other set of solutions. I think the kinds of solutions that might work in a place like Toronto are using modular shipping containers to try to rapidly build housing. Uh, I know that in Toronto you're already planning on putting up these large industrial tents to house the homeless during the cold Canadian winters. Well, that same land could be holding modular uh, housing. You build these micro units, they stack up like Legos, um, and you can rapidly put them up in a much shorter time than actual housing. One of the issues we do have in Canada, we like to think we're kinder and gentler than you guys, but the fact is we have three levels of government that fight with each other all the time, right? The national government, the provincial government, and the local government, the city government. And, and what you've just described may make perfect sense, but it will require uh, the negotiations and the wisdom of Solomon to get the three levels of government to agree. You know, the city's got to provide the land, the province has got to do the appropriate zoning, the feds have got to transfer enough money. There's no advice you can give to get three levels of government to be on the same page on this. So what do we do then? Well, yeah, certainly the United States provides no help on that. Um, <laughs> But, you know, I mean, the, the thing that, that, that strikes me is that for people in Toronto, is the current status quo acceptable? Can you really have this incredibly rich, beautiful city um, with so much wealth and yet so much poverty side by side? Um, what what's, makes it happen is a group of people saying this is not acceptable. And in LA, that, that happened, and I was happy to be part of it and to watch it. That's how LA uh, passed two bond measures, both the city 
passed a bond measure and the county passed a bond measure. You know, Americans, U.S. people do not like taxing themselves. Uh, and yet people did it because they also recognized that this is really an issue. Uh, huge encampments are not a strategy for dealing with homelessness. You say in Los Angeles there was a group of people that came together and just put their foot down and said enough was enough. Can you tell me more about that group, the characteristics it might have had and so on? Well, I think it, it was some combination of civic leaders um, and business people and those with more humanitarian health care who were recognizing that um, it just was not acceptable to have these large encampments. One difference uh, that may tell us something between Toronto and Los Angeles is that Toronto uh, has a large shelter system. Mm -hmm. And so essentially what's happening is you're, uh, you're pushing away the problem. And I'm a, I'm a fan of shelter as a solution for tonight. What I'm not a fan of is spending money on shelters for years and years mm -hmm. instead of building housing. Part of, I think, what happened to LA is there was no shelter system. And so it was so apparent, so many people on the street with their wheelchairs and their walkers um, that finally even business people, hard-nosed people said, you know, this is not good for tourism, this is not good for our development, mm -hmm. and therefore supported the bond measure. I've heard from homeless people who say all you need to know about how much fun it is living in a shelter is the fact that many people would prefer to be outdoors in zero degree temperatures rather than spend the night in a shelter. They say they're dangerous places and, you know, you can get beat up overnight, you can get your stuff stolen, all that kind of thing. So that's, that is not a solution, is it? That's I, not a long-term solution. I agree, and, and I'll tell you the converse. We've never found somebody who couldn't be housed. There's this myth that there are these people who want to live outside, but it's exactly as you say. They'd rather live outside than live in an unsafe shelter where the sheets may not be cleaned very often, where they're at risk for being abused, especially the women. Um, if it's a mixed shelter um, or if they're living on the street or in a tent, um, and so, yes, they would prefer to live on the street. I understand the role that government can play in making this happen. What about private developers? What can they do? Well, uh, often uh, cities have uh, requirements that private developers who are building large buildings have a set aside. Um, so I think that it befalls government and developers to say, you know, how do we set aside a reasonable number of units for people at the very low end? What's a reasonable number? Well, I think most of the cities that don't have done it set aside to do 15%. So if you're building a building, 15% has to be for people who are at the bottom economically. Now, here's the dirty little secret, Dr. Katz. If you strap somebody up to a polygraph machine, you would learn that no one, if you live in a condo or an apartment building, if you're not homeless, you don't even want 15% of the units in your building to be occupied by homeless people because that's them. It's another kind of a person. It's not like us. What do we do with that? No, I like to tell people about a homeless person we worked with who lived under the freeway until uh, we housed him. And when we housed him, one of the interesting things that happened is he reconnected with his daughter who he had lost contact with. And the story makes sense when you think about it. How many fathers would want their daughters to see them homeless, dirty, under the freeway? But once he had a place to live, it was possible to have family reunification. All of those people that we see on the street walking alone, they have families. They came from somewhere. Um, they're people just like the rest of us. Is that true? They're people just like the rest of us? Because I don't have to tell you that you will run into people who say, you know, they're suffering from mental health problems, they're drug addicts, they're not like us, and that's why so much of the rest of the population is never mind doesn't have it a priority to, to help them, but is afraid of them. Well, I understand some of the fear, but mental illness is an illness, just like diabetes, just like cancer. It just so happens it's an illness that causes people not to seek treatment that they need. Mm -hmm. Okay, in our last couple of minutes here, let's just finish up with your experience. Uh, take LA, take New York, whichever one you prefer. What have you been able to do, and how much of a dent has it made in the problem? Well, uh, in L.A., uh, my, my New York experience is relatively new. In fact, I feel about New York City the way I feel about Toronto. I'm still in the learning phase as to how we're going to do it in, in New York City. But in Los Angeles, where I spent a lot of time, 
we were able, when I left after seven years, we were able to house over 4,000 people. Now they're up to 6,000 people. And these are all people who are chronically ill, who were in the hospital, who were in the emergency room. We saw massive decreases in the number of hospitalizations of homeless people, uh, massive decreases in the number of emergency room visits. And overall, we saved money simply because we took care of people in the appropriate place. And those 4,000, those 6,000, they are unambiguously better off today. Absolutely. Our, our housing retention rate is 97% because why would they leave? Housing retention rate meaning they move in there and there's no recidivism. They don't end up in the streets again. No, there's no reason for them small to do percentage. so. And we can do that here. Absolutely. You're Canadian. You can probably do it with more humanity. <laughs> now, don't, don't imbue upon us all these characteristics that, um, that we may not deserve, right? Um, but you think we can do it here? Yes. What does it require? Will. By? By, it has to be the, the government, you know, uh, in partnership with the philanthropic groups uh, and the business community. Gotcha. You've given, a, given us a prescription, doctor, so now we just got to go fill it, I guess. That's Very the good. idea. That's Mitchell Katz. He's the president and CEO of New York City Health and Hospitals. That is a seven billion dollar healthcare organization, biggest in the United States. Thanks so much for finding some time for us at TVO tonight. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.